sweet, man. Well, you were just saying about um, federations allowing or potentially not allowing a good discussion to be had would be around how an individual turns up to a show, mm. whether they should be encouraged to not get on stage if they're not in condition or close to the criteria or something like that. What, I think, think so. Like going off the, the the backlash of the social media from previous shows, I it had me thinking, you know, to save individuals from that kind of social media like flogging almost, to have like a prejudging before they're even like registered for the show. Because if they're not gonna fit the class criteria, if they're not in condition to to a set point, like don't get me wrong, they don't have to be absolutely shredded out of their heads, but if someone's going to get on stage and they know they are nowhere near the mark, is there any efficacy of letting that person just take part just for payment within the Federation? It's a tough one, isn't it? Because Mm. any individual is free to sign up to compete and they can view the criteria online Mm -hmm. and they can decide if they should or shouldn't be there. Um, Is it the Federation's job or is it even impinging on freedom for them to not let them get on stage if they think that they should? Or yeah. do they have an ethical implication to tell people if they're opening themselves up for embarrassment, maybe? And then another argument would be, well, the Federation doesn't want to lose money yeah, you know, by not letting these people compete. But then do they even ethically look worse by taking the money of people that shouldn't be competing? I think it's a tricky ethical situation. And... You know, I've seen the arguments made on on Instagram on those posts that you mentioned where people say, well, at least they're up there. Don't see you up there. Or they might have lost £100 to get there, but then maybe they should do like a transformation class or something, you know. Knowing the right federation as well. Like you say, like doing a weight loss transformation class would be far more suited to that person than a show where, you know, true condition is needed and they're not near the mark. Yeah, go to FMC or something like that or, you know, sort of PCA. I think it's a really hard one. The thing with bodybuilding is your pros are in the same gym as your amateurs. Mm-hmm. And there's there's no stratification, really, unless you want a pro card, between someone who's never competed and they can be in the same gym as someone who's mm-hmm. at the Olympia. So they don't really see the differences. It's not like you're playing Sunday League football and you've got the Premier League to compare yourself to. So you haven't got different tiers of competition. So I can understand why people would just go, I can go and compete. I can just go and compete and get on stage. And you obviously don't know that person's backstory. Like if someone turned up, to shape, turned up out of shape by out like a competition standard, they might have lost, like you say, £100. So whose right is it to say don't, don't compete? It's, it's a tough one. I think probably I would encourage the coach or their friends to be like, look, this is the... The, the, the category that you're going to go into, and this is what they look like, do you now feel comfortable going into that? And obviously it's their informed decision at that point. But I do think it creates a like you said, a bit of an issue of freedom where if you say, oh, I don't know if you should compete because you're not quite there, people go, why can't I compete? Like, yeah. I can rock up to Sunday League and I'm shit at football. I can kick a ball around because I'm going, Matt, you're shit. And I know I am. <laughs> that's fine but I'm here but still but I still want to kick a ball I'm not, I'm not trying to play at, the, play at the Premier League level you know what I mean I still want to kick a ball around so if they enjoy it and they know what you're getting yourself into by all means but no one's transporting me into a, into a Premier League game but like, mm. we go, mate. I agree I think ultimately it would come down to like the people closest to that individual whether that be the coach or the loved ones because they'd know the true background of where they came from how far they've been you know have they been through this 100 pound weight loss or have they just misinterpreted what bodybuilding and dieting actually is and think that's enough to put them on stage? So I think it would be their call to say, look, this is what you're getting into. Are you ready for that? But then also, if federations know that they're allowing people on stage who aren't in the true condition, who are potentially setting themselves up for that, blogging on social media, then turn comments off on posts. Yeah. Like, Don't allow that to be there because then it <clears throat> is going to massively maybe not discouraged, but it's also going to put that person in a really shitty standpoint of going, why did I do that? Like, I'm now in this position of really questioning myself, like confidence is going to be through the floor. It's hard as well because let's say the individual turns up and they get to reg and somebody says to them, you're not lean enough or, you know, that's going to kill them. Mm. And 
the question becomes, is it going to kill them more than the public yeah. humiliation or decrement that might happen on social media? Or is it better for them to find out? Or like you said, look, they've got access to social media like everybody else. They can look at the class criteria or previous winners mm -hmm. and look at themselves. You know, maybe they need a reality check. Yeah. <clears throat> maybe as harsh as that sounds. So some practical recommendations would be, I guess, at the very least, if you're going to compete and you haven't competed before, um, I wouldn't say get a coach, although I would recommend that you get a coach, obviously, but at the very <coughs> least, be around some people that have knowledge of the competitive side of the sport and can tell you honestly and objectively what you look like and not just what you want to hear like you look like. Yeah. You know? And um, be aware of that before you go in and pick the right class in the right criteria like we say if, if you've previously been obese or really overweight and you've made a awesome um fat loss journey progression transformation whatever that's great and you might want to showcase that on stage to people and you should if that's what you want to do but probably not at a bodybuilding federation yeah you know, you've got other places like fmc pure elite do it i think miami pro do miami it pro, yeah yeah, transformation challenges where you can get on stage with other people that have been for a similar journey. I think it's a cool thing to go and do. Like you say, amazing to see people do that. But I think the other thing I would say from a practical practicality standpoint is really understand why you're doing it in the first place. Because I, I see it quite often with people who've gone for a transformational amount of weight loss and they kind of <laughs> use that to form up their, they prop up their identity. And if you're... This is going to get a deep, bit deep now, but if your entire self-worth is based upon your external image that you put out to the world <clears throat> and you all of a sudden get a lot of criticism on that, that's going to kill you. That's going to really hit you hard. So understanding why it is you're doing it in the first place. Are you doing this because you've gone through this journey and you want to showcase that? That's one thing. If you're doing it because you want to get some external validation, and we all want that, and let's not lie about it. If you're doing it solely for that purpose and you get some bad feedback, is that going to make you feel better or worse? And probably going to make you feel worse. So just understanding why you're doing it would be a good start. Good working example of this, actually, is your client, that Thog Fit. I don't yeah, know his Michael. full name. Michael. Yeah, so we saw him at the posing seminar <clears throat> on um, Sunday, and I had a brief chat with him, with you, and um, he knew 100% what kind of stuff he should be looking at to be competitive. You know, yeah. he wasn't wondering. He wasn't saying, yeah, this year I'm going in and doing this and that. Exactly. He was talking about yeah. transformation <clears throat> challenge. Yeah. And he was excited. And, you know, he's that kind of guy. He's made unbelievable progress. Yeah, 45 But you've kilos. obviously armed him. Wow. Yeah, 45 kilo. Wow. What's that? Not worth well, 90 plus pounds, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 100, 100 pounds. 100 pounds. Yeah. Jesus. So you've obviously armed him with the knowledge mm -hmm. of how he can go and showcase that effort and be rewarded for it and be celebrated for it. Yeah. But not in back, like imagine like getting embarrassed for such incredible progression. Exactly, and and th this is the thing. Like we discussed this on the day as well. Like having that level of weight loss, there is going to be things like loose skin. In a bodybuilding federation, you are going to get marked down on that because it's an imperfection within the physique. So, are you going to set someone up for failure and go, yeah, you know, let's go for a bodybuilding federation where they are literally going to scrutinize every part of your physique? Absolutely not, because it's going to tear them to shit. So, doing a transformation category where he can go, right, this was me before two years ago, one year ago, one and a half years ago, whenever he decides to get on stage and go, this is me now. People are going to see that transformation go, yeah, crop class work, like, absolutely. And then, you know, further down the line, because he wants to make bodybuilding like a full-time thing, five years down the line, if he does put on a shit ton of muscle, yeah, cool, then go for like bodybuilding <clears> classes. <throat> but, you know, start off like where you want to go first with the, the transformation stuff. And I think this kind of, going back to like if we can pass on guidance is like go to shows as well mm. watch what's going on stage before you actually do a show yourself because then you're seeing the expectation of what people are or should be on stage as well and you're like exposing yourself to that got a topic i was thinking on a little bit yesterday <coughs> i was thinking about this after seeing uh seeing a post on social media um and i got thinking on it as a topic and i thought it might be cool for us to speak about a little bit um so a quote-unquote evidence-based um, influencer coach posted up some training reels of them training. And um, 
it's not important, but very high volume workout, um, sort of high frequency, high volume thing, lower body session. Um, and put a, a remark at the end that made me think a lot, uh, which was a bit of a, a jab at the more sort of bro science crowd, you could say, where they put in quotation marks, worked for Dorian, right? Which was like, um, it was almost like Dorian Yates training would have been the opposite to what they were doing. And th they were saying it, I can't remember exactly, but it was like a, a tongue in cheek remark that mm. basically if you would follow or if you would use the wording, it worked for Dorian, then you're essentially an idiot. <laughs> um, so, you know, a bit of intellectual arrogance, but it got me thinking about what Dorian did do. Yeah. And got me thinking about some, I think, incredible practical takeaways that have been with us right from day one of resistance training for bodybuilding outcomes, all the way back to your Steve Reeves and whatnot. And um, maybe we could discuss a little bit about what those things are, because I do genuinely feel like, as somebody that is maybe positioned somewhat in the evidence-based space, I'd like to say that I've got my my foot in both camps. Um, sometimes get lost in the minutia. Yeah. Um, and we were talking actually last weekend, weren't we? About I was uh, I spent some time looking back at some of the old training routines from the guys from the forties. <coughs> Excuse me, and. Um, you realize that science on training hasn't really taken us much further than what they were doing in the 40s, and it worked incredibly well. Um, and still to this day, we don't really need to know much more than what they knew for 99% of people's goals, maybe even 100%, which brings me to the Dorian example. Let's talk a little bit about what he did do, specific to training, because we could talk about, we could talk for hours about his nutrition approach, PED approach, mm -hmm. or whatever. So the obvious very first thing is that he trained with a sufficient level of effort. And science has told us that the closer that we get to failure, the higher threshold motor unit recruitment is going to occur. And then per set, uh, as references the dose, the greatest magnitude of hypertrophy will occur. Now we can argue back and forth around what RAR is most efficacious per set, whether it's one RAR or not RAR more often, whether you should accumulate RAR for a mesocycle or whatever. But what we do know is that, forget all of that for a second, you have to train with a high level of effort. And he made sure that that happened. Yeah. So that's the very first thing. <clears throat> the second thing I'd say is that in any interview you listen to with Dorian Yates, or if you've ever read his training logs, which I, which I do have, I used to be a Yates mega fan. Mm. I've actually trained with Dorian twice when I was younger in person, which was really cool, at, at the old Temple Gym when it was still open. Um, progressive tension overload was number one. Mm. And through the off-season, he set himself load and rep goals on various movements that he would achieve no matter what. And those two, for me, are the most, the single most important variables <clears throat> in hypertrophy training. In whatever study you want to pull out on any amount of volume or what's most efficacious this volume or that volume or accumulating volume here or there or what you do with RIR, whatever. The single most important thing is progressive tension overload, is applying more and more mechanical tension over time. And he made sure that that happened. And he clearly trained with a sufficient volume or he wouldn't have grown. Mm. And he clearly trained with a sufficient frequency or he wouldn't have grown. Uh, could he have benefited from a higher frequency? Well, if you look at his early training logs, he was training... I think it was like full body pretty much three days a week. And then most things twice a week. I think over his career towards the end, it was that four time per week split of training everything once a week. But still the the evidence on frequency is pretty mixed. You know, it, especially if you consider his size, his strength, <clears throat> very may well needed, even with his low volumes a week to drive the degree of adaptation required between those sessions, which again... If we reference back to hypertrophy research, you're looking at people that are untrained or moderately trained or recreationally trained at best. You don't have super heavyweight bodybuilders in these studies, so we have to go on anecdote. And just speaking personally, the bigger, the stronger, the more advanced individual that I coach across the board, the less frequency and the less volume that they can adapt and recover from. 
So he put that in Dorian's scenario. He clearly adapted his programming and auto-regulated it over time as what was required. So, And also, to talk about volume, I think we get so <clears> lost <throat> in this 10 to 20 set per week, like hypertrophy range. Um, and there's absolutely no way that 10 sets is a minimum amount needed to grow. You know, that's where people I think have gotten confused with these evidence-based recommendations like every man, woman, and child needs at least 10 sets per body part per week to grow. It's just not the case. And there, there's never been any study to show otherwise. You know, there's plenty of data to indicate that muscle protein synthesis is elevated aggressively from one set, you know? And how many of us have seen clients grow from three or four sets of a specific body part a week, <clears throat> you know? If, in fact, if we take a rough average, like three sets with a high effort a week is sufficient to maintain, well, then four sets a week is definitely growing you. Yeah. It, maximally, I don't know. Who are you? You know, but, you know, to say don't, it worked for Dorian, like, you know, look, Dorian's a freak. <clears throat> he is a freak. He's genetically, he was built for this. Look at the photo of him at his first show when he's fully natural. It's insane. Um, but to rubbish him when actually I think he had a lot more down in terms of his understand, understanding of training, the most evidence-based individuals these days is uh, just sheer arrogance, probably. Everyone in the evidence-based crowd, we're all, we're all talking about minutia. And I spoke about this on a reel I did the other day. If you look at all the top coaches, <clears throat> performers, everything, they probably agree on 90% of stuff, right? You could take us as evidence-based and people to, to like to throw us into that crowd and, and compare us to someone who's more bro sciencey? I imagine we're doing a lot of similar things. Diets, primarily whole foods, unprocessed stuff. I imagine there's going to be sufficient training volume. Exercise selection is going to be fairly similar. Programming is going to look fairly similar. 90% um, of that's going to look the same, right? So when you're taking someone who's achieved an extremely high level, clearly maximize their physique. That was going mad. Clearly maximize their physique. To then say, I... Oh, like I don't think um, I don't think they knew what they were doing. Almost to like like make an extreme example, it's a bit dumb because everyone kind of does the same shit. It's that nuance that people differ in between. And I'll use a different example from another sport. People used to say Kobe Bryant would be better if he got more sleep. How the fuck do you know that? It didn't. He used to sleep. Was it five hours? Yeah, you say. Yeah, yeah. Like five five hours sleep. Those How, interviews, he's like, I, I only need five hours. How the fuck? You know, <laughs> well, theoretically, yeah, I agree. But did it work though? Well, yeah, pre worked pretty fucking well, to be honest. We're talking about like, did it work though? I'd be willing to bet there's not an individual on this planet that you could put on even the latest stage of Dorian Yates training program. You know, we train everything once a week. Mm. You're doing a small collection of sets to failure each time you train <clears> that body part, maybe three or four sets to failure. I'm pretty confident that everyone would grow. I'm not going to say optimally mm. or maximally because inter-individuality is huge. But at the least, if you're progressively overloading and training with that volume and that effort, you will, you will grow. But the optimal thing is a funny one because, firstly, how you can, you can never know, right? So take someone's training career and they really like training in a specific way, right? So take Dorian, where he trained, he loved it, right? He was able to do that for a long period of time, training really hard and doing all the things that he enjoyed. He is going to get the most out of himself there, or at least like in a practical sense. If he tried to go, right, what we're going to do, mate, is we're going to run you up to 50 sets per week. He's like, I fucking hate this. Yeah. <laughs> He's not going to stick to it. So the theoretical exercise is a pointless one. <clears throat> it comes to mental masturbation where you're going, oh, yeah, we theoretically could get some more hypertrophy because this one study on whatever showed us this. You're like, yeah, theoretically, can they stick to it? Probably not. So ultimately, train hard enough with sufficient volume, do it for long enough, and you're going to, probably going to get the most that your physique can get you because we'll never know where that upper limit is. We'll never know what optimal is. So trying to... Theor like theorize obviously we want no we want a vector we want a direction in which we're going to take our training and all these other factors but we're never going to get there that's like me saying i'm going to achieve all my dreams you're not mm. but you can get close to it by just working hard to, to extend on mm. that the thing i think dorian did very well 
is he didn't care what other people were doing. He paid mm. no attention to it. He was like, this is what I do. This is how I do it. That's why he was called the shadow, because he just disappears, stay focused on what he had to do, and then come back. He wasn't tempted by studies or what other people were saying. He was like, well, this is what I do. This is how I'm going to do it. And he just stuck to that. It worked for him. I, I somewhat predict, I make a prediction, that we're going to see a renaissance in the training volume realm with the evidence-based guys. I think there's going to be some kind of reactionary backlash to the the findings of like the Enos study and whatnot. I do genuinely think that volume is going to become far less interesting to the evidence-based crowd we as time goes on. It. I wouldn't. I don't know if I've changed my mind on volume. I'll, 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 I'll reiterate. I think we've changed how we practically apply it to clients, because I certainly have over the last two years. I definitely ought to regulate differently mm. than I mm. used to, for sure. I've gone all kinds of directions with training volume. Um, but I've just been really putting a shift into reading a lot of these studies and the the problematic nature from the measurements to the participants to the length of study and whatnot is um, more concerning for me as time goes on. And also just how effective lower per session volumes are and how marginally, you could say, ineffective additions above that point are for most people, if that makes sense. The one thing I, I would definitely agree in terms of you get a lot from a little, you don't get much from yeah, much more precise. from a lot. Yeah, yeah. The one thing I will just change on that slightly is I think you can get a lot more out of it when you're younger, you're a little bit more robust. As you, earlier in your training career. Yeah, earlier yeah. in your training career. As, as I've got older, I certainly see this with my older clients, I think you want to trend volume up because you, you're not going to be able to send it like you used to. Mm -hmm. And that's something I've, that's where I think training volume could be extremely beneficial is if you know, I imagine, I don't know about Dorian's training, but I would imagine maybe as he got a, a, a older, there were some areas where he probably wanted to do more volume because he needed to. I think his volume reduced over time. I would expect to see someone would, would have reduced over time as they got stronger, but I'd also think if you were to move away from failure, you'd want to raise up your volume so you kind of equate it. Does that make sense? Yeah, talking a little more, a little bit more about volume and those um, those ten to twenty set recommendations. Just um, you know, as a working example, I'm on full brojo mode today, <laughs> but um, I came up in the era of the like intense muscle forum. Preach with. Scott Stevenson and Dante Trudeau. And I saw physique after physique after physique blow up on DC training. The two-way split, for example. Love that one. And if you look at some of the volumes that they're working at, you know, that's a so two-way split would be an A routine and a B routine. So Monday A, Wednesday B, Friday A. So you're essentially training all body parts like a 1.5 time per week frequency. And in many body parts, you're only doing one DC style rest pause set. So that's typically, if I remember correctly, two rests. So like two rest pauses. Initial set plus two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you probably, let's say you're performing like two or three reps per rest pause. You're probably accruing like two sets worth of quote unquote effective reps if we're going to use that model. So you're talking about two sets per body part per session, one and a half times a week. So extrapolate it out. So that would be six sets over two weeks. So three sets per body part per week mapped into the effective reps model. And they absolutely blew up. Three sets. Do you think that was also, I'm going to just take a little sideways. That's definitely not me saying, by the way, that that's like the best routine. I fucking love training. I loved it. Oh, I, I did it for years. And, and I grew on it, obviously not much. Um, but, you know, and then later moved to fortitude training, which I pretty much just stuck at the fortitude basic the tier one. Yeah. And in very, very, very low volumes, but so many people grew. And, and I think because it was clearly sufficient volume and sufficient frequency, but the focus was on a high level of effort and progressive overload. I also think it was, this was my tangent. That was when, don't have to say this in a, it sounds like a point of the industry, Social media wasn't as much of a thing and people just went, I'm going to stick to my fucking gaining phase. Mm -hmm. I'm going to gain for six months and I'm going to cut it back. And I think, I'm not saying that is the most optimal way of doing it, but people were more inclined to commit to a gaining phase because they hadn't got post-shredded pictures on Instagram and they would just go, I'm committing to this thing and I'm going to get jacked. Yeah, hundred. Yeah, it was different It was different times back then. But also, like, it's easy to pull on the drug card there 
So all those guys were abusing PDs or, or whatever. But the more common thing in my experience back then was, you know, Dante used to say like, let the food yeah, yeah. do the work. Food's loads biggest. of these guys have been on like TRT and blowing up huge. I mean, this really sounds like I'm shilling for like really low volume training and stay <laughs> at TRT. And I'm not, I'm just trying to make a, a point more so to present almost play devil's advocate in a way, away from this range that the evidence-based crowd have got so stuck in of like 10 to 20 sets per body part per week. It's like, that's just not like, uh, we can't look at that 10 as, right, this is minimum effective volume per body part for everybody because it's just not the case. I do think it's a good place to start. Is it not, let's say start, but I think it's a good average and then you can assess where you fall on that. Like you say, I've got clients, they do two sets a week of quads and they are blowing up. And you're like, we found that out because... Doing 10 sets was just killing them, mm -hmm. right? And you, you go, oh, let's reduce this down a little bit. And you find where their point is. We, we, we have to start with somewhere, right? You have to go, that seems like a good place to go. Um, but, and more volume could be better for some people. Again, f find out. But one thing Dorian did really well, he was his own experiment. And I think that's where you can go two ways with it. People are like, I'm a special snowflake. Shut the fuck up. Like, you're not that special. But at the same time, experiment with it. See what you like, right? Because some people are going to like training a certain way. Some people like training another way. The same way that you would modify an exercise for yourself to see what feels good, do the same with your training volume. And you'll find over time where that is for you. And I know, for example, like I'm, I, I'm someone who's had a lot of knee surgery. If I was trying to send it with a low volume approach to, to legs, my knee will fly off and I'll lose it on the other side of the room, like a kneecap be on the other side of the room. Not going to work for me. So I have to try and do a lot of other stuff to make them work. And it's not really working particularly well because legs are still shit. But you see, the point is like, you've got to experiment with yourself to a degree. And I think Dorian was exceptionally good at that. Do you think, to throw like a, a little bit of a spanner in the works, do you think that typically the bodybuilding realm now have that very much a more equals more mindset that people bias higher volume because they think the more they do, the more they're going to gain from it. I think there's part of that. And there's also, I mean, social media is so challenging for people that are obsessive and growth minded mm. because they'll see something on there about high volume. And it'll be like, again, I don't want to sound like I'm like selling out high volume or something here. I'm not for low or high volume or whatever. Um, I'm for whatever we can figure out is most effective, but you know, it's like the shiny new thing or it's something someone else is doing that I'm not doing. <clears throat> and I don't like that. I don't like that someone could be getting more than me, so I'm going to do more. Yeah, I don't mind more time in the gym. I don't mind working harder, you know. But it could be, I mean, we haven't in science found the inverted U for volume yet, but it, it almost certainly exists. Um, I personally believe that it's far lower than what the research might indicate, at least for very advanced individuals, for sure. Um, but I think it's that like, oh, no, they're doing something that I'm not doing. Yeah. And I don't like it. I think we're to blame for that a little bit ourselves because we're going, okay, more volume could be better. And we're having we're trying to have a nuanced discussion in, in a realm which nuance doesn't like to exist. Yeah. So we're saying potentially, because the research is showing that more and more volume could be better. And if you're doing really low volume, maybe if you've got a body part which you're struggling to grow or you want to grow a bit more and you're not growing, maybe do a bit more. If you're happy with the, the rate of gain that you've got at the moment, all good. Maybe do more. I think that's where the nuance comes in. But also you are looking at bodybuilders where more has got to be better, right? More drugs, more food. Like it's almost like we wear it as a metric. Oh, drugs went up this high. Food went up this high. There's so many sets I'm doing per week now. Mm -hmm. Like, And again, some people, you, you, you see it, this is how little I'm doing or how much I'm doing. No one's like, I'd love to be in the middle ground. They're like, yeah. give me the fucking most because we're all creatures of it we all want more and i think there's an element of that and i'm fully aware like we're sat here talking about volume we've spoken about maybe do more so you've got people mm -hmm. on the internet who maybe haven't got a critical thinking ability and they just go just do more then and more yeah. more if more is good then more <laughs> more than more is better without thinking actually where does it work for me well what i'll say then is if people are wondering about volume looking at the current programming is that if you're performing some kind of dose of volume, let's say twice a week or however frequently per week, and you're adapting, therefore next time you revisit that session, you are progressively overloading, 
then it's sufficient. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. If you're not recovering, then do less. If you're not doing enough to apply a sufficient, adequate stimulus to drive the adaptation, then do more. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't need to really frequently change, especially for, we'll say, hobbyists, we'll say maybe, you know. It doesn't need to frequently change. In fact, if you change it too frequently, you could just limit the amount of progressive weeks that you have and end up having to just deload sooner and overreach sooner and whatnot. You know, even <clears> if <throat> even if you're looking at your volume like, God damn, I'm only doing like two sets per body part per session. Look, if you're progressively overloading week after week after week, getting stronger with matched execution and whatnot, just leave it. I mean, that, there's a, there's a, <laughs> I would say it's the clients all the time. They're like, I want to do more volume. I was like, why though? Because if, if someone said to me, Matt, you go to the gym once a week, do one set, and you'll be as big as you'll ever be, surely you take that trade, right? Time, injury risk. you would be like, well, that sounds fucking brilliant. Like, you'll look exactly the way you want, and you'll get to 300 pounds jacked, but one set, you were like, yeah. So yeah. when you zoom out, you're like, well, obviously that makes sense. But people are like, no, I need to do more. Because, again, we're kind of conditioned to that to some degree. Mm. Ah, someone was asking about potassium. Tracking potassium and sodium and fluid and things like that. Yeah. Um, so the way that we would initially set it up and whatnot. So, I mean, we've got loads of posts on the forum about sodium and potassium and their physiological roles and how they'd be useful for bodybuilder and contractions and blah, blah, blah. You know, all the things. And I mean, I think hydration is uh, an obvious one, but electrolytes come into hydration as mm -hmm. well, as you, as you boys know and as the viewers will know. Sodium and potassium are very important for adequate hydration so generally what i'll do and this is not a fixed hard and fast rule but let's talk about fluid first there'll be a homeostatic amount of fluid that somebody intakes and very rarely would a human uh, under consume fluid who's an athlete seems like we ought to regulate that quite well um at least in our cohorts i'm sure there's people that like habitually don't consume enough but you know most bodybuilders they're going to be drinking at least sort of four liters of fluid a day right and a real rough guideline that I've used, and this isn't fixed, this is a kind of rough start point, is I quite like to run about two grams of sodium per litre of fluid. So if you're drinking about four litres a day, or, or four to five litres, about eight grams of total sodium per day. Um, that doesn't mean eight grams of salt, it means eight grams of actual sodium. So if you plug all of your food into chronometer, make sure that you use like the... USDA approved data, so it'll have sodium listed, and then plug salt on top of that. You can have a look and see where sodium ends up. And it'll also tell you where your potassium totals are. If you put all of your foods in there, including all of the veggies that you eat and whatnot, um, it will total up your potassium. And generally speaking, I want to begin an individual, like a one-to-one -one ratio, potassium to sodium. If you're eating a lot of fruits and veggies then and whole foods, you shouldn't find it too difficult to get six, seven, eight grams of sodium, of, of potassium, sorry. But if not, just use a, a low salt, um, which has typically the, the Saxa one, I think it's called Solo, that's 50% sodium, 50%. So it's 50% salt, 50% potassium citrate, I think. And then low salt is a little bit less sodium, more potassium, I think. But all of those metrics are on chronometer, and you can weigh those out at the beginning of the day. I just got a little Tupperware. I just put my salt, and if I use low salt, I put it in there. I don't typically need to with my fruit and veggie intake. And then run that one to one and see what happens. Normally, it takes like three days for fluid balance to shift with any sodium, potassium, fluid changes. Um, but you can just measure hydration, rate of urination, pumps, performances, and see if anything needs adjusting from there. That's my sort of simple start point. I think. I mean, you pretty much nailed it. I'll, I'll, there's a couple of things I'll say to add on that. And this is another reason which I, I do encourage most people to move away from a stereotypical if it fits your macros. Because if you were to just hit a decent amount of fruits and vegetables per day, and we always like to say a kilo, but again, that's going to differ. I probably eat like three kilos like fruit and veggies a day because I love it. But find an amount that you can stick to con uh, consistently. It's going to be good for health. But it's also going to hit your potassium <laughs> targets. So you, you won't struggle, provided you're hitting a mostly nutrient-rich diet to eat your potassium targets. That's going to be pretty much a given if you eat any, any resemblance of a healthy 
bodybuilder diet, you'll hit that. Fluid wise, aim for five to six clear urination today, I would say. Like if you're pissing yellow, you need to drink more. And if you'll find that you just are not thirsty, maybe salt your meals more or find something like Brad's got a, um, a Volvic with a sugar free in the, like by his feet. I'm willing to bet that's just war. Just war. Well, yeah. I, 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 well, let's assume it was. It let's was, pretend. Yeah. Let's pretend for this. It was a tasty, sugar-free one. Have that. Have some squash. Something where you know you like. It's more palatable. You can get more fluid in. Right. That's absolutely fine. Or Hydromax from Strom, which is what I'm currently drinking. The uh, the cocoa mineral in it is, that is, nice, is that delicious. One. Although don't ever double scoop it because the amount of coconut water in that makes you, makes me feel. Well, also that would be ten grams of taurine, which is quite a lot of GABA action. So you might find yourself a little bit too relaxed. I just feel like I'm going to be sick. Okay, that's what I always feel like. But you're probably going to get your hydration in just from that and that alone. And then you can weigh your salt out, and that's something where I would encourage certainly people who want to be super accurate and maybe to trial it. But again, your body's pretty good at finding that that point. You'll find if you're eating more fruits and vegetables, you'll probably want some more salt naturally. You'll probably like, oh, that, I want some saltier foods. Yeah. Maybe I'll, you'll notice, but. I'll put that maxim on there. Like if you're a hobbyist trainer that wants just body composition improvement, you don't need to be like overly analytical with your potassium and sodium and fluid totals. If you're trying to be a high performance athlete, it's definitely worth diving into those. And it takes a little effort when you've got it nailed down. Like, because most people are weighing their food anyway. We'll just weigh the salt that you add to it as well. Um, but you definitely don't need to do that or worry. Like if you're going out for the day and you're grabbing some food at Subway or something, don't worry about the sodium and potassium no. on I, there. I would definitely, know. even as a hobbyist, I'll still probably check, just make sure you hit your potassium because I'll find my, my sodium will be in a, like in a range. And also don't get too caught up. Like if you say have seven grams of potassium, people like weighing out to like the, the milligram of how much salt I need to add. It doesn't need to be the exact same numbers in a range where it's like pretty similar is, is, is fine. Um, but again, provided you've got all the other bodybuilding behaviors, like your diet, sleep, hydration, you're probably, you're probably going to find you there automatically. Um, and if you find like you're, say you are drinking 20 liters a day, maybe you stop drinking the squash. Maybe you stop yeah. drinking your Pepsi Christian Nazi. Chapman stuff. Yeah, right. This is literally, I've, I've been there though, like in a diet, you're thinking, why am I always so hungry? No, I've never done that. Oh, I've done it so many times. Like I'm drinking like, honestly no joke probably like 15 liters of fluid a day i'm wondering why i can never be full i'm like because i've got i'm just i'm fucking almost hyping, hyping to dream it prep without like thinking about it i was easily doing like between 12 and 14 liters yeah and but how much hungry and worse do you feel because you like you're just depleting yourself they can't get ever get a pump anyway because you're on prep but it's even worse with that but yeah it's something i've, I've seen yeah just try <laughs> try and find a middle ground do you do anything different, Brad? Or you like- no, I'm pretty... Un- I think the only thing, like... I mean, you two went pretty extensively in that. I think the only thing I would add is if you are going to track it, then actually track it. Yeah, yeah. Don't just be like, oh, yeah, I'm probably low on electrolytes. Let's start banging electrolytes all day because I've had clients that just can't stop shitting themselves because 